137 people are on board this British Air Tours flight. I could see orange flames inside the back of the engine. Within minutes, nearly half of them will be dead. The fire in the cabin had been severe, but should not have been catastrophic. This leaves investigators with two questions. Why did so many people die? And what caused the fire? It's a cold winter's evening at Stapleton Airport in Denver, Colorado. Captain Stephen Silver and First Officer Ralph Harvey are just about ready for takeoff. Hey, everybody seated? Yeah, everybody's in. No good outside? Walk around was all clear. Trans Colorado Flight 2286 is a short hop to Durango La Plata County Airport in Southern Colorado. Listen, when we get to Durango, I'd like to get in the air again as quickly as possible. Shouldn't be a problem. We won't need to refuel. It's the crew's fourth flight of the day, and they're running late. Bad weather has put them 40 minutes behind schedule. Trans Colorado 2286, you are cleared for takeoff. 2286, clear for takeoff. Thank you. Captain Silver is in command. First Officer Harvey will operate the controls for this flight, leaving the captain free to handle radio calls. Takeoff power. 100. The captain keeps an eye on the airspeed as they accelerate for takeoff. V1. And rotate. The crew's day began in Denver. After two short hops to Riverton and Casper, Wyoming, they circled back to Denver. Now they're headed for Durango, a route that takes them over the southern Rocky Mountains. About 20 minutes from the airport, the captain and the first officer review the landing. So we're still doing the straight into runway 20, OK? Runway 20, sounds good. Control, we'll plan on a DME to runway 20. That's approved. Trans Colorado 2286 cleared for runway 20 approach at Durango Airport. Like many small airports in America, Durango does not have its own air traffic control. The controller is in Denver, more than 200 miles away. Speed set, one quarter flaps. One quarter flaps. The pilots work quickly to prepare for landing. Gear down. Gear down. Three green. Do you have the runway? Something's wrong. The pilots can't see the runway. Damn, we're too low. No, Pull out. No, 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 no. Hold on. Of the 17 people on board, the crash has killed nine, including both pilots. Investigators don't know who was shot with the final bullet, just that it was fired in the cabin. It's enough for them to finally piece together a picture of the horrific final moments on board PSA 1771. What the hell? You can imagine what Ray Thompson must have thought as this person whom he had just terminated a few hours before walks past him in the airline, hands him this note, and then probably goes into the men's room. And he's reading this note with its ominous message. Next, they hear the sound of the lavatory door opening. So we're, con we're assuming that he handed Ray the note, went into the restroom where he took out the gun, came back out, we heard the door close again, just before the shots. Ray! 
Ray Thompson probably has the most merciful of all the Dez on that plane. In less than a minute, a routine flight Stay has become a nightmare. There's a problem, Captain. What's the problem? He was very careful. He had done the planning thus far for, uh, fairly well. And uh, we believe he, he followed through with that plan. I'm the problem. It wouldn't take much knowledge or experience on a, on a passenger part to know that they were in deep, deep trouble. After shooting his former boss and three crew members, David Burke pushed Flight 1771 into a dive and left the cockpit. The airline's chief pilot was now the only person on board who could pull the plane out of the dive. An off-duty pilot may have been moving himself forward to try to render whatever assistance he could once he realized something drastic was happening. What the hell are you doing? You gotta let me in there. Don't do this, come on. But Burke had one bullet what left. What the hell are you doing? That may have accounted for the sixth shot. There are some who speculate that David Burke was taking his own life. The evidence suggests otherwise. Had David Burke been taking his own life, the gun would have fallen from his hand after he had shot himself. But since a fragment of Burke's fingertip was recovered from the trigger guard, Bretzing reasons that the killer was alive, holding onto the gun until the very moment of impact. Alarms were sounding in the cockpit. There was uh, increased uh, noise of the plane plummeting. Then just before impact, it became silent. They tell us that it actually broke the sound barrier. Of course, it would have been a horrifying experience, the final few seconds of their lives. One man's rage meant two minutes of pure terror for 42 people. There are 77 passengers on board Continental Airlines Flight 1713. They're headed to Boise, Idaho. It's been snowing all morning. Controllers are busy trying to get a lineup of planes off the ground. Continental 1713, runway 35 left, cleared for takeoff. Continental 1713, cleared for takeoff. B1, rotate. Positive rate. Damn it. The plane is barely off the ground, but there are signs of serious trouble. Eight people die in the crash, but rescuers save 54 lives. Bob Benson will lead the investigation for the National Transportation Safety Board. It was my first uh, big accident for a major airline, and uh, I was a little intimidated. It was snowing at the time of the accident. It was below freezing, and these aren't ideal conditions for aviation operation. But then again, we couldn't focus on that immediately because other aircraft were taking off and landing uh, routinely. So it had to be had to be something more than simply bad weather. Investigators know that Flight 1713 barely got off the ground. The lack of lift points to a possible cause: wing flaps. Flaps are out, no question. They quickly discover that the flaps on Flight 1713 were in the correct position for takeoff. 
Investigators will need help from the plane's two black boxes if they hope to crack this case. What clues do the Flight 1713 recorders hold? Investigators won't know until NTSB technicians get a chance to analyze them. 28, you are clear for takeoff. Stop. 137 people are on board this British Air Tours flight. I could see orange flames inside the back of the engine. Within minutes, nearly half of them will be dead. The fire in the cabin had been severe, but should not have been catastrophic. This leaves investigators with two questions. Why did so many people die? And what caused the fire? During a routine inspection a year and a half earlier, mechanics had found small cracks in some of the combustor cans. Since the repair, there were 11 reports of slow acceleration from the engine that exploded in Manchester. A damaged combustor can could have been a reason for the problem, but the log entry led Captain Terrington to believe that the problem had been fixed. Investigators still don't understand how a fire outside the plane spread into the cabin as quickly as it did. Believing he had a blown tire, Captain Terrington made a fateful decision. Stop it. 28 Mike, we are abandoning takeoff. Captain Terrington turned his plane to the right and brought it to a stop. He couldn't have realized that doing so would make the problem far worse. There was a crosswind, a slight crosswind, from the left side of the aircraft that was carrying the fire that was burning from the fuel that was pulled underneath the left wing. It carried that fire aft, rearwards, and to over and under the rear fuselage in between the wing and the tailplane. The wind wrapped the fire around the back of the plane and into the cabin. Investigators have discovered how the fire started and the conditions that caused it to penetrate the cabin. Now, investigator Ed Trimble must solve the biggest mystery surrounding the Manchester accident to figure out why so many died. Investigators learn that most of the dead were not found in the worst burned parts of the plane. Autopsies will point to the real killer on Flight 28. Korean Airlines Flight 007 and all 269 people on board have vanished. All efforts to contact the flight have failed. There was concern that it had been either forced to land or crashed, or within hours, the story began circulating in Washington that, that the Soviets had been involved. As the world waits for news about the incident, U.S. military officials make a horrible discovery. At the time of the flight's disappearance, U.S. soldiers heard what they thought was a routine Soviet training mission. It doesn't seem possible that the Soviets would actually shoot down a passenger plane. But American officials have little doubt. The next morning, U.S. Secretary of State George Shultz delivers an unusually blunt statement. The United States reacts with revulsion to this attack. Loss of life appears to be heavy. We can see no excuse whatsoever for this appalling act. 1983 is the height of the Cold War. Russia and much of Eastern Europe are united by communist ideology. Ruled with an iron fist, the Soviet Union is locked in a bitter political struggle with the West. Relations were bad, but no one really knew how bad, how dangerously bad they were. Initially, Soviet officials deny responsibility for the KAL disaster. The story came out of Moscow was that the plane appeared, we intercepted it, tried to make it stop, it didn't, it flew away. That was the first story. But soon they reverse course and come clean. A Soviet fighter jet did, in fact, shoot the plane down. But they insist the attack was justified. 
The Soviet view was that it was on a spy mission, perhaps carrying instruments, cameras, uh, recorders, and so forth. The Soviet Union claims Flight 007 entered highly restricted airspace under orders from the U.S. government. But the U.S. insists KAL-007 was a routine passenger flight. The dispute only heightens political tensions. In a rare move, U.S. officials share highly classified surveillance data from the night of the shootdown. A top secret technology called passive radar can track the movements of every military and civilian plane around the globe. What it reveals about KAL-007 is stunning. The plane was way off course. For almost its entire journey across the Pacific, the flight had been drifting north. By the time it was shot down, Flight 007 was 350 miles north of where it should have been and had already flown in and out of Soviet territory. The Soviets were telling the truth. And then it becomes a question of determining why was it of course that much.